This is uh, Dr. John Martin, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Butterfly, and I'm pleased to welcome Michele Covella from, from Italy, who has been a physician, remarkable physician, on the front lines uh, battling COVID-19. Uh, being from Italy, he has been at the focal point of a lot of the, the activity in this world. We've learned a ton from him, and we're pleased to have him join us today. So welcome. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your, your background, your specialty, where you practice, uh, a little bit about yeah. you, so they can get to know you personally. Yeah, uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician. I work in the emergency department in a small city in the northwest of Italy, uh, Aosta. Um, I've uh, graduated in uh, uh, Torino uh, in 2011 and finished my uh, fellowship in uh, internal medicine in uh, 2017. And since then, I've always been working in the emergency department. Uh, it's what I like to do. And uh, I've been trained in uh, point of care ultrasound and uh, um, echocardiography during my uh, fellowship. And uh, I've been using ultrasound for my daily work since then. I'm sure the, the, you probably uh, never expected what you've been hit with here. Did, did you feel as if you had any kind of training to be ready for this? Or do you think, uh, like many of us, this has just hit us like a wave of something we never really anticipated? No, it, it totally came as a surprise, unfortunately. And um, yeah, um, it seems like it keeps coming as a surprise for everyone, even though now it's been a few months already. Uh, well, that's kind of the important reason why we want to talk to you. So when did you see your first case uh, of, of COVID-19? Uh, I think it was around the 5th of March. And so when, when okay, so if you th think the beginning of March is when you had the first positive case, when did the, what was your lag from a few cases here or there to all of a sudden you were swimming in the deep end of the pool? Uh, we had about a week of, uh, of just seeing a few cases here and there. And then it was very sudden. I, I remember it was a Friday when they started coming all together. And since then it's, it's been like that. And uh, they, the patients keep coming in, uh, in a very predictable fashion, mostly come uh, end of the morning and uh, late in the afternoon, like two daily waves. And, uh, Every day has been very similar since then. And what's the typical number of patients you see a day now with this problem? Uh, well, I work in a very small hospital, a small city, and uh, we see about 20 to 30 patients uh, oh. each day. Wow, that, that's a lot. How many beds does your hospital have to, to hold these patients? Uh, so the hospital, uh, used to have uh, 400 beds and uh, 10 ICU beds uh, and 10 infectious disease beds. Now the ICU beds have uh, become 35 and we have about 150 beds dedicated to COVID patients only. So you've tripled, the, more than tripled the size of your intensive care unit to manage this problem. Yeah. Let's walk back to when be, the week between you know, one patient and then all of a sudden they started coming. What kind of things did you guys do in that week interval to get ready? And are there any important lessons you learned in that process um, that they could, you could share? Um, and is there anything you wish you'd have done now that you've been through the rest of this scourge? So one thing that um, we learned late is that the uh, epidemiological criteria that uh, we first thought was going to be useful to find these patients is obviously no longer useful, but uh, it shouldn't have been useful even at the beginning, uh, because now we're starting to find out that the virus had been circulating in Italy uh, for several weeks before uh, we officially found out. Um, during those first few days, uh, we prepared a, a dirty pathway for uh, suspect COVID patients. Uh, with a triage tent outside of the emergency department where all patients with fever or any respiratory symptoms are triaged and uh, kept separate from all the other patients. Um, and at first, this seemed kind of pointless because we set up a 
big tent and we only saw like one or two patients a day uh, to keep resources and nurses and uh, staff there. Uh, and then obviously it turned out very important. Um, however, I'm not so sure that the uh, decision to try and divide uh, the hospital uh, between a dirty and a clean uh, setting, so COVID on one side and all the rest on the other side, is, is feasible. Uh, what we're seeing more and more is that patients uh, who apparently have no um, reason uh, to be infected turn out to be infected after a few days of hospitalization. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, all precautions should be taken for all patients who are hospitalized, regardless uh, of the chief complaint, because uh, um, it happens all over the place that uh, we spread the disease inside the hospital uh, because we, we put infected patients uh, in, a, in a clean ward. And so any of the real big things, like if you would say to, um, let's not use New York City because they're in the middle of it, let's pick a city that hasn't quite hit it yet. And the one piece of advice you'd give them, what would that be? I don't know, this is a, this is a very complex problem and obviously there are no easy solutions. Um, if, if time allows, uh, stock up a lot of uh, personal protective equipment, uh, because that runs out extremely quickly and it is extremely important to keep uh, all workers safe. Uh, right now I'm uh, out of the game for a few days and I know that I would be very much needed uh, over there. So, um, Well, you, you've, you've brought it up. I, I suspect you didn't voluntarily, knowing you even the brief time that I've known you, that you took yourself out of the game. What pulled you out of the game? Um, so these days we are working uh, some shifts inside the, the tent outside of the, of the hospital and some shifts we're working in the normal emergency department, which is almost uh, deserted. And I believe uh, that the day that I was most exposed uh, was during one of the shifts inside the hospital. So in the clean environment, so to say, uh, I remember um, taking care of a patient, an, an elderly patient with a stroke uh, who didn't seem to have any reason uh, for infection. Um, and uh, on a routine chest radiograph showed uh, bilateral uh, infiltrates and later tested positive for COVID. So this patient was one of the patients who were not treated with all the personal protective equipment. And this could have been a potential source of infection for me. So you're, you are currently, uh tested positive for COVID and now quarantined yeah. to the house. Exactly. How do you, how do you feel? Uh, right now I'm feeling almost perfect. I uh, had uh, two and a half days of uh, fever and headache and general weakness and fatigue, a uh, little bit of nausea, a little bit of cough, uh, but it went away very quickly. Uh, we've started a protocol with hydroxychloroquine uh, for outpatients with uh, any sort of symptoms, and uh, I've been taking hydroxychloroquine since the first day of symptoms. Uh, I think I'm out of it. Uh, I'm waiting to repeat the swab in a few days uh, to see if I can get back to work. So do you take that with the Zithromax, the Z-Pack, or are you taking it just hydroxychloroquine alone? Um, I am taking it alone. Um, our protocol is open to both uh, possibilities. I had uh, mild symptoms to begin with. I decided to take it alone. Uh, I think right now we're uh, still uh, uncertain to what the optimum to what the optimal uh, protocol is. Evidence is is very scarce. Uh, it might so, turn out that it's better with azithromycin. It might turn out that it's better without. We, we we're waiting. So obviously now that you've had one of the unique experiences of living through every aspect of this, um, I think there's a very valuable lesson and I've now heard this repeatedly from physicians around the world. I think the greatest danger candidly to our workers is not the people that come in with obvious respiratory stuff because we're all over them. It's the, the people that come in with stuff that are completely appear 
heart attack, a broken leg, a gallbladder problem. I think those are the ones. And I think your message is one that I keep hearing over and over again. At this time, we have to treat everybody as if they have an infection. And I think that's really the shift and, and a, a really important message for, for new hospitals that are about to face this. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the big problems with this approach is that it dramatically increases the consumption of uh, personal protective equipment, of course. Um, so uh, it's, it's not something that's easy to, to put into practice, but uh, it's necessary. Now, you're, you are a long ultrasound expert. You know, the Italians, you guys are famous for the fact that you've actually been on this and been ahead of the rest of the world, candidly, for a long time. Tell us how you used ultrasound before this uh, epidemic, how you use it now, and will it change anything after it uh, in the way you use ultrasound in the future? Uh, so I've, uh, I've been trained to use ultrasound and lung ultrasound combined with our uh, IVC uh, uh, deep veins uh, for the evaluation of any patient with uh, respiratory complaints. Uh, this has become very, um, important with COVID patients because they typically show um, very recognizable patterns. Um, so, using lung ultrasound on these on the on the suspects um, gives us an immediate idea. Uh, first of all, if the suspicion of COVID is reasonable or not. For instance, if you see a respiratory patient with a significant uh, pleural effusion, well. COVID patients very rarely have significant pleural effusion, so you must think either something else is going on or something in addition to COVID is going on. That's an and important second, point to, to pause on for a moment because I don't often hear that said. And I think one of the other things you start to hear people doing is we've, we've got almost this disease bias. Anyone that comes in with respiratory things, we, get, we, we immodically focus it, it must be COVID. And you've brought out a really important point and good utility of ultrasound to make sure you don't forget people still have congestive heart failure. They still can have a lot of other things that have respiratory compromise. So I appreciate you making that point. Uh, go ahead. And, uh, and another aspect uh, of which it'd be very interesting to have uh, data. Uh, right now we only have our, our um, gestalt is uh, how compromised the patient is going to be based on how compromised his lungs uh, look on ultrasound. Um, I don't think there is anything that's, uh, that's called evidence on this aspect for now, but uh, uh, there are obviously uh, varying degrees of, of compromise and they are very easy to appreciate with ultrasound. And we do see that the patients with a very dramatic presentation have always a very uh, important uh, lung involvement on ultrasound, uh, but it would be interesting to understand uh, if a lung ultrasound has some predictive value for patients with a mild presentation, because those patients with mild presentation sometimes have involvement of only very few lung segments, sometimes have a, a more important involvement, uh, but we don't know if, if this means anything. Um, as, as far as uh, how well they're going to do uh, over the next few days. I think this is a re another uh, really important point, and that is, you know, I've, I've seen a myriad of uses. You know, I've got people that don't use it at all and say, listen, we use hypoxemia, for instance, their, their clinical parameters to make the decision to admit or send home. We certainly know that if you just use resting hypoxemia, you're going to miss some folks. So there's a number of people that use a walking protocol, for instance, and see if there are PO2 drops. Although I've not heard any, what degree of drop actually is significant enough to bring somebody in. But I've also heard from people around the globe that, that before that even, you can see lung findings that are significant and may be predictive of trouble. And I think, I wonder if you guys have seen in the ICU as you communicate with your colleagues, one of the striking things about this and scariest parts is the respiratory decompensation appears to be very rapid. A little bit like you're driving a car over a cliff. You think you're fine, or okay, and then boom, they get really sick. Has that been your experience? And is there anything that yeah. you've identified that would be a good predictor of that? Yeah, it, is, it has definitely been our experience. Um, we have seen it both in inpatients, people we hospitalized um, and we thought were going to be fine and then suddenly uh, 
did worse over a few hours. And we have seen it in uh, patients who came from home, who came telling us that uh, they were doing fine and they uh, just had a fever for, for several days and all of a sudden they've, they start feeling short of breath and their blood gas analysis look awful. Uh, I've not uh, been able to, um, to see anything on lung ultrasound or any other um, clinical aspects that predict uh, if these patients are, are going to suddenly deteriorate or not. Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be very important uh, to have such information. Unfortunately, I'm not sure uh, we'll be able to identify it uh, quickly. Also, it, it needs to be very accurate in order to work because uh, obviously uh, we're, we're talking about patients who need uh, uh, a high intensity of care and uh, we can't afford uh, to miss potential cases. So uh, it's not going to be easy, I think, to find this, this sort of information. So you get to the point, and, and this is an, an another interesting discussion, and that is, um, you know, should we ultrasound everybody? And, and maybe, maybe the answer is we don't need the information now to make a decision, but having those images and then ultimately their clinical course, when this is all said and done, we could look at the data and say, okay, what did we learn? Because we know this is coming back. We're going to see this again, um, because we, we obviously will see another episode of, of flu, is, is the, of, of of, at least the experts are saying this is coming back at some point. Can we learn something quickly? And the flip side is when you're so busy, it's hard to actually do all of this kind of data capture because you're just trying to survive. And I don't know if you've got any ideas on how we can do this because we desperately need the information. As you, as you said, when you're trying to survive, it's, uh, it's very hard to think about anything else. Um, so I'm not sure what the best way to proceed is to gather useful data and to use it in a meaningful way. Uh, I hope that someone smarter than me will. Well, my hope is that, you know, you, you guys up there have just been inundated, but there are places in which there are lower volumes of cases. And then in those situations, you're, you know, you can more, more methodically, if you will, and strategically manage these patients and capture data. The flip side of that, the other argument out there, and it's an important one, the longer somebody sits there getting lung ultrasounds, the longer they're exposed. One of the things we've heard is maybe we abbreviate, if you will, the ultrasound, turn the patients away from us and just use a limited number of segments. What protocol are you using to do lung ultrasound on the patients when you choose to do it? Um, so uh, I have learned that it is unfortunately quite useful to look at all the lung fields that you're you're able to look at because uh, there are patients with a uh, limited involvement, uh, and if you're only look at if you're only looking at the bases, you're going to miss uh, some of those uh, findings. Um, so, what I've been trying to do since the beginning of this is uh, to look at at least two intercostal spaces in the interior lateral and posterior fields and uh, to do longitudinal scans of the anterior lateral and posterior fields. Um, however, uh, I'm not sure that uh, gathering all the data, uh, also that on uh, patients with uh, minimal involvement is clinically useful. So uh, if, if someone told us, you need to look at the bigger picture, you need to look at only patients with a significant uh, compromise well that that would be an indication to to run a quicker exam um, and to possibly uh, improve safety we certainly got a lot to learn here um, so how how long does it take you to perform your lung exam what's the time period would you say uh, if I'm if I'm not recording the clips probably two to three minutes so it, it's still pretty pretty fast if, if the patient cooperates obviously if the patient uh, if the patient is unable to to sit up or to turn sideways that makes it harder if i'm trying to record the clip as i've been trying to do uh five to six minutes probably uh, interesting well we got so much more to, to learn here your inpatient colleagues um and maybe even in the emergency room have you seen the cardiac decompensation that we're starting to get glimpses of that you know the paper came out of seattle they talked a little bit about this cardiomyopathy have you guys seen the same thing there and any predictors of that uh so i've i've not had a chance to follow up 
on inpatients very much. Uh, I have seen one patient uh, who crashed in the uh, emergency department in the, in the triage tent uh, who had a significant compromise of his ejection fraction. Uh, but this was a severely hypoxemic patient, a young, otherwise healthy patient but, uh, who came in with a saturation of 50% and never went up uh, higher than 75 on CPAP and was immediately intubated. Uh, he had a severely reduced ejection fraction, could have been secondary to hypoxia, uh, could have been secondary to a cardiomyopathy, uh, hard to tell. Well, it, it's, we're obviously incredibly grateful for the information that you've been sharing with Butterfly. As, as you've seen, we're really trying to leverage the, your experience and the experience of your colleagues on the front line through our website and through the webinars and through things like this. You have a lot to teach us. Um, what I've been struck with is how many people are learning in a vacuum when we have great people like you who can share such valuable information. So we're deeply appreciative. We, you have the entire team and now the world that sees this rooting for your rapid return. Let me ask this final question. When will they let you go back? Are they going to quarantine you for, quote, 14 days? Or as soon as your cultures are negative, they're going to let you get back in the fight? So the, the protocol says that uh, the quarantine has to last for 14 days. And after that, you're allowed to return uh, if uh, you have uh, two negative PCR. Uh, however, I think that we will need to customize that protocol for uh, hospital workers. And uh, maybe if I am asymptomatic for, uh, I'd say, at least four to five days, I'll, I'll ask if I can repeat the swab. And, uh, and if the PCR is negative, uh, uh, I'll probably be able to go back a little earlier. Well, we're humbled by your dedication and your willingness to serve, and, and we will follow your progress closely. And thank you very much for sharing everything with us, Dr. Cavella. And we wish you and your colleagues the best of luck as we try to get on the other side of this. <laughs> thank you.